Do you like wrestling trivia? Then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today. This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Welcome to another episode of The Good, The Bad, and The Hunky here on the Voice of Wrestling Podcasting Network. I'm your host, Tyler Fornis, and unfortunately, Fred is stuck in the Cody Vader, so we don't know when he'll be back. Uh, Please send this... help. Oh, hey, he's back. Perfect. Hey. Um, that, uh, right. We were worried that Matthew and Nicholas were um, doing some incredibly obscene things, like uh, hit him with super kicks with, uh, with uh, shoes filled with tacks, but looks like he came out unscathed. Yeah, uh, Taven did try to hit me with a super kick, but he slipped a little bit first. So I was able to roll away. That's pretty impressive. The athletic feed, Fred. Good for you. Thank you. Let's uh, let's dive in because AEW right now is a fascinating company, and I don't think there's any more fascinating story right now than Jungle Boy Jack Harry. Now, if you have listened to um, other shows like The Observer. Uh, wrestling observer radio you've uh, probably understand the general gist so we'll we'll kind of touch on it um jack perry says he never apologized for the punk fight his request for a release was denied and he didn't hear anything from tony khan for two plus months after the fight and he also said that there were plans to bring it back in december but they were shelved when punk debuted for wwe and this is in reference to him in, with his new japan run and him being the scapegoat, which to me is just phenomenal. I absolutely love it. But it seems to be rooted in reality, Fred. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a funny situation, and it really the uh, the majority of it just screams uh, work to me. To be honest, um, I, I do believe that he was like suspended initially after the fight, and Tony Khan probably isn't very happy with him. Though, frankly, uh, you know, I uh, I think uh, Jack Perry is not necessarily the guy who deserves the most blame in that situation. But hey, we've already kind of litigated that whole CM Punk deal to. Uh, to death at this point um but yeah so jack perry showed up in new japan uh what was it a couple months ago now as the scapegoat uh wearing a goat mask and uh basically well you know another member of the endless bullet club and uh positioning himself as like i've been rejected by AEW, uh and so i'm really moody and angry in new japan uh, he is pretty clearly still under contract with AEW. it seems um i would be shocked if he would have been released, frankly. Um, you know, if he uh, just did a little goofy thing on camera that made CM Punk freak out, even though it's CM Punk, your biggest star. I mean, you know, at some point it's got to be CM Punk's fault. But uh, but yeah, so, you know, and uh, Dave Meltzer came out last week and talked about how, uh, you know, it, Tony, you know, talked about some of the situation, said that Jack Perry kept trying to apologize to Tony Khan um and uh that they're you know that he is in japan doing a storyline currently to build up his to his return uh and then jack perry came out and did an interview saying he actually never apologized for the fight and he asked for a request which was denied and uh, didn't hear from tony khan for two months after the fight um he also said the plans to bring him back in december were shelved when cm punk debuted in wwe um I think See, that I want your opinion on that point, point, Fred, because I think that's the most interesting part of this. Yeah, I think so, too. Why would they shelve it? I think the general theory would be that they didn't want the brawl out to really be brought back up in depth. So they just kind of kept Perry away thinking, oh, if he comes back around the same time as Punk joins WWE, then people are going to start talking it. And we don't want that to be a part of the news cycle. Th that's my theory. But I really want to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I just think that 
I don't know. Uh, I could see the idea that, well, if we bring him back like the same week the CM Punk debuts, then we're just going to deal with a whole lot more talk about Brawl Out when everybody is just exhausted with it, I think. Uh, but I also wonder if, you know, that's just a little smokescreen. Uh, uh, so much of this discussion right now um, from Jack Perry in particular, just, you know, and Tony Khan, like, no commenting pretty much anything related to this, screams uh, just a whole angle to me. Um, it seems very much like a work that is eventually going to build Jack Perry coming back to AEW on screen. So I don't really see why, you know, they're going to do 90% work and then, you know, just drop, you know, a little bit of truth in there. I mean, they could, I guess, but nothing really stopping them. But yeah, I think their primary focus is just on building this whole Jack Perry has been shunned by AEW. And so he's, you know, now a, a moody goth. Yeah. Sorts. I also think that there's some merit to a discussion point that I've heard elsewhere that him being in New Japan will send then they will send him to Chicago. They'll get all their boo birds out real quick. And then when he comes to AEW, that won't really be as much of an issue. Now that you still have Shawn Michaels, whenever he goes to Montreal, he gets booed out of the building. But yeah, we're not talking about the Montreal screw job here. We're talking about punk being punk and eventually that's going to calm down. And I think it's it'll it's already calmed down a little bit with the elite. I think it'll calm down with Jack Perry in the same way as well. This is all fascinating to me. And I'll be honest, this may be the best thing that could have possibly happened to Jack Perry because he has to go out of his comfort zone, which has become AEW. He has to develop a new character, which he, he did rooted in reality. He feels like he's the scapegoat for the whole CM Punk thing, which I completely understand that way of thinking. And you look at all the nuance and you look at how he's had to grow himself as a professional wrestling character, how he's had to adapt, and he's not Jungle Boy anymore. He's a I, jungle man. He is a jungle man. What's what's extra funny is I've been watching the show Oz, hmm. and his his dad plays like an evangelical preacher, essentially. Like it, it's it's just funny. I didn't realize it was his dad at first because I I like never watched Beverly Hills Nine Hundred Two One Zero or anything like that. But I'm like, oh wow, yeah, that's definitely Jungle Boy's dad. And yeah, I I think it's good. For it him is him uncanny. Overall. Yeah. Now is it good for him being House of Torture? We can have that conversation later. But I do like that we're seeing improvements here. Yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, I just saw this next week on Dynamite, the 3rd of April. Uh, we've got Will Ospreay against Powerhouse Hobbs. Listen. With, uh, Don Callis on calm. This is just another stepping stone to get Will Ospreay uh, out of the Don Callis family in canon. Mm -hmm. And I think this is objectively a good thing. He's already beaten Takeshita. He's already beaten Kyle Fletcher. Now he beats Powerhouse Hobbs. Well... What happens now? And I think that is going to be really intriguing because it, having him with Don Callis made a lot of sense when it came to the Kenny Omega feud and when it just when it came to kind of building up that match. Completely understand. Now that he's in the company, you don't necessarily want him with Don Callis. So I yeah. think this strategy could really work. We'll see if they land the finish because it, it's like a gymnast. You can do as many flippy doos in the air as you want. If you don't land, it doesn't matter. So... I'm intrigued to see what happens here. Yeah, um, I think it's, you know, I, I have to assume that it's going to end with uh, Osprey turning his back on the Callis family and, you know, uh, getting some kind of a feud going there, maybe with... Uh, I some... think they kick him out because yeah, th if he turns his back on heels, that baby faces them. Mm -hmm. Well, he could just say that they're terrible people and he doesn't like them. So that is yeah, also that, an That's also fair. All right, let's move on to some other news. Um, I'm going to keep my eyes on this whole Jack Perry thing because I find it fascinating. Um, he's facing uh, Shota Umino at uh, Windy City Riot. And before that, it's him and I think it's Ren Narita versus John Moxley and Shota Umino at Sakura Genesis in, I, I, I think it's just a tag match. It might be a hardcore match. I, I That part I don't remember, but... It, that'll be interesting. I also find it interesting that Moxley is going to be facing Naito, presumably for the IWGP World Heavyweight title, and he's not facing off against a member of LIJ. Yeah. Very interesting there. But 
We are not the New Japan show. If you want great New Japan, Super J Cast. Nobody does it better. Uh, let's talk about Mexico because, of course, uh, Wheeler Yuta has not been cleared yet. So he is out for tonight's CMLL match, which is the Blackpool Combat Club, John Moxley, Brian Danielson, Claudio Castagnoli, and Matt Seidel versus Ultimo Guerrero, Mystico, Volador Jr., and Blue Panther. And what's really cool is Blue Panther, who was famously unmasked, has gone to the, the Council of Lucha. I'm not quite sure what the, the, the kind of how regulation that, body. Yeah, the regulation, um, which is going to be similar to like what a sports commission is in the United States. And they have approved him wearing a mask in the match, yep. which is the uh, kind of signaling the old Blue Panther because we know how much Brian Danielson has wanted to face Blue Panther. And on the back, there's some words written in Spanish on the bottom, and it is painting like uh, – stylings of brian danielson and old blue panther so that's gonna be really cool um arena mexico sold out three weeks in advance which according to people who are who know the scene very well and even live in mexico were shocked because that just does not happen yeah. there's almost always you can walk up and sit in the bleachers up top no it is 100 percent sold out that tells you that Fans in Mexico are excited for this match. They're excited to see these foreigners come in, and that's objectively a good thing. Look, the second that this comes out, I'm going to be getting my hands on it. I will be watching. Like, oh, yeah. Brian Danielson, the second he walks out in Arena Mexico, is going to look like a five-year-old walking into an unlimited candy store. It's, it's going to be so cool. And we could have gotten this years earlier, but WWE sucks. So... We're getting it now, and I'm very happy. Yeah, it's uh, pretty cool, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. Um, I think that uh, I can't. I don't. Ha I can't from the couple pictures I see, like make out the entire words with uh, the Blue Panther mask. I'm unfortunately not that familiar with Spanish, but yeah, I mean the fact he's got um got that mask on. Uh, is you know and has the permission to wear his classic mask with you know the added spray painting on it uh or uh, airbrushing i should say uh i don't know man that should be really awesome even if like blue panther and ultimate guerrero are old as hell like uh, how, how cool is it that blue panther thought it thinks enough of brian danielson to go to the commission and be like i would like to wear my mask for this match for this reason that is fucking awesome yeah, like and it really is. I am no lucha expert, but my guess is that people involved in love the world of lucha aren't really going to have too big of an issue with this because it's a one-off. It's not being disrespectful, and I mean, I guess you could see it as disrespectful because you got a mask, but you go through the proper channels and it's a one-time thing. Like Volador Junior. still comes out in his mask. An mm -hmm. Andrade still comes out in his mask, but they don't wrestle in it. That's yeah, the that's the rule. big difference. You can you can wear it all you want. You cannot wrestle in it. And the fact that there doesn't seem to be this outcry, and if there is, and you follow the lucha scene, please let us know. But uh, in the uh, preview uh, from uh, Lucha Blog at the Cubs fan, he did for Voice of Wrestling. It doesn't sound like that's an issue at all, which is really really cool. And I, we're nerds like that. That kind of stuff rocks. Little things matter because they make big things better. Yeah, totally agree. God, it, you know what would be sick? Brian Danielson comes out to the final countdown because, like, I mean, uh, CML probably has different operating procedures, let's be real, they do, than AAA because AAA will just use whatever music oh, they yeah. want. Yeah. I wonder if CML would use the final count countdown. That'll probably just be a wild thing, but hey, who knows? Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I'm, you know, really excited for it, and it should be a great match. Uh, also, of note is that Willow Nightingale is also going to be on this show. I forget what match she'll be in, but um, is she in a match with Stephanie Vicker? I think it was, I thought it was a multi-person tag that she just kind of got slotted over on the Rio thing because hey, she's from you know America, but uh, will, that is I, how CML yeah. books. I will also say I love the continuity in, in how they replaced. Wheeler Yuta, because Matt Seidel helped the Black Bull Combat Club win the the Rudo Luchadors 
started attacking them. And yeah. like, it's just a little thing, but they didn't just pick some random all-star to send down there. He's got beef with the luchadors because of how they've been uh, acting on collision and dynamite. I, yeah. like, it, it's a little thing, but it makes sense why he's joining up with the Blackpool combat club. It's not just some rando it's, Hey, you have a beef. We have a beef. We can uh, like the enemy of our enemy is our friend. I, I like it. It's it's just a little thing, but it matters. Yeah, uh, should be uh, should be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. And who knows? We may even review it next week. Dave Meltzer reported that it looks like Kenny Omega is more likely to have surgery than not. Based on the little I know about diverticulitis, it sounds like having the surgery is probably the best case scenario for long-term health rather than just not having it and kind of waiting it out. Because to my knowledge, well, it can just come right back and flare up like a like a big pain in the butt. So like, I feel like it's, it's – look, for the world of professional wrestling, not having Kenny Omega for potentially longer sucks. But I also think it's probably for the best – for his long-term health. That, that, that's my read on it. I'm not an expert. The only thing I'm an expert on is getting my abdomen sliced open because I lost my appendix and it, it decided to almost kill me, but it, I don't know. It, it, that seems good. It, I, you know, it's, it's a relative thing though, right? Because he could just heal from it and not need the surgery, but yeah, ideally he would just heal on his own. Um, unfortunately, you know, it doesn't sound like that's happening at least efficiently enough. So what you've got to hope for is, you know, uh, a nice recovery from the surgery and abdominal surgeries uh, can take longer to uh, recover from than, you know, comparable uh, surgeries elsewhere on the body. So, yeah, you know, just uh, hoping it goes well and, uh, you know, that he's uh, back and healthy ASAP, you know, regardless. All the best to Fire Elite member Kenny Omega. Um, okay. We need to talk about this, Fred. Hmm. Tony Khan and Eric Bischoff. Now, I did not get a chance to grab the tweets, and I only vaguely saw them. So could you explain this to me and then the audience through me as their surrogate? Okay. I'm going to pull up Tony Khan's Twitter because this is legendary. Absolutely legendary. So... Eric Bischoff tweeted out that, um, or John Alba tweeted out that the the show that they did, um, eighty three uh, weeks was it or no? Um, all I'm, the business one supposedly. Yeah, I'm I'm scrolling to try and find it because it's it was from like a couple days ago I think. There's a not a non zero chance he deleted it. Yeah, I think he deleted it. Oh, boo, Tony, boo! Time to time to search through the Slack channel because it will, <laughs> it will be there. Yeah. Essentially, um, Eric Bischoff um, tweeted, or John Alba tweeted that he was done doing uh, like a show on business with Eric Bischoff, and then. Tony Khan just tweeted something real, real snarky and just, oh God, I can't find it. It's, you know, this is absolutely tremendous podcasting, but. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. Let me see if I can Google it real quick. Um, basically, uh, Khan uh, said uh, something along the lines that, well, well, Eric Bischoff said, you know, that we're, they're ending their business podcast. And uh, Tony Khan responded with a little swipe that was along the lines of, uh, it's really good that you're doing this right before I announce my, uh, our new TV deal. Um, oh, that's what it was. Just uh, it's a white it's specifically sunsetting this fraud of a business podcast before the next AW media deal is a wise choice. So now, to Bischoff's credit, he is he just subsequently announced a uh, YouTube series that he's calling Wise Choices. Which uh, look, that's good sass. I, I can't not say that. Yeah, I, I doubt anything of value will come from the show, but you know, cred for the for the title given. You know, listen. Um, 
I ha- I hate Bischoff. I think he's a fraud. He may be a genuinely good human being, but I think he's an absolute fraud. Uh, I, I will also say Bischoff is doing a different podcast, I guess, um, which is hilarious. At, um, Bischoff uh, put a poll up. It looks like it's on his YouTube. Why did Tony blast Eric on Twitter? He's one under too much pressure. Snap. Uh, two. He just likes trolling on Twitter. Or three knows Eric is right. Just an incredible response from Eric Bischoff. I need to give him credit because he's just rolling with it. And he's like, hmm. It seems like Tony knows I'm right. Just <laughs> incredible grifter. Like, 10, 10 out of 10. He's still a, he's still um, one of the worst things about wrestling media because it's all about grifting. It's not about being genuine. But just a phenomenal response. And... Tony going after him like that is just perfect. Yeah. I will not be editing any of that out. So enjoy listening to us trying to find uh, what's going on. Um, let's continue on here. Jake Roberts is re-signed for another year. Good for him. Um, let's hope that somehow means that we get to see more Lance Archer, which yeah. we, I know it won't, but I I'm, I can hope. We have Let's new ranking. Force and Ring of Honor, you know. Yeah, I know. We have new rankings. Um, yes, we do. Any thoughts on those? Takesh is not on there. I found no. that interesting uh, because last night's match with, or sorry, Wednesday night's match with Swerve Strickland was for the number one contendership. And he loses, and all of a sudden he's out. I find mm-hmm. that interesting, but it's not absurd. You lose, you drop. Makes sense. Maybe he's sixth. And if he's sixth, I don't think that's really as big of a deal. Yeah. But it's noteworthy. Um, other than that, I really don't have much much to say. I, I would argue that uh, you could probably put Will Ospreay at one because of the level of competition he's already beaten. But Swerve has a longer history with the company since January 1st. And he's getting so, the title match. So, mm-hmm. And he, he was... Did he get pinned? No, Paige tapped. Uh, so mm-hmm. even in his loss, he didn't really lose. Right. So it, you, you could make the argument for Will Ospreay. Quite frankly, I don't care. Um, I think uh, Swerve, he's getting the title match. And look, these are just a gateway to um, you can manipulate them however you want. Oh, so yeah. you can get the result you want. Entertainment purposes only. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's uh, continue on. Let's go through this uh, Super Card of Honor card. We may yeah. talk about it a little bit more next week. Um, the ROH World Championship will be defended as Eddie Kingston defends in Philadelphia against Mark Briscoe. I think we know what's happening there. ROH Women's Champion Athena defends against Hikaru Shida. That could be really good. The ROH TV Championship. Well, I really like this. Kyle Fletcher defending against Big Shoddy Lee Johnson. Yeah, that's like, uh, I'm intrigued by that. I hope that uh, Shoddy does well because I've thought he's had uh, some skills for a while now, <laughs> and uh, I'd like to see him uh, show him off. You know, have yeah. a good match. The ROH Women's TV Championship Tournament Final: Queen Aminata versus Billy Starks, two young up and coming women. That could be good. It could also be a little rough, but either way, I'm very intrigued. And then, a is this a Stardom versus Tokyo Joshi match or just a Stardom match? I I don't know enough about. Uh, Joshi that's Stardom. That. Stardom it's versus all Stardom. Stardom. Okay. Um, Mina Shirakawa, Mika, and May Seira. Or yeah, I, sure. I might um, pronounce that wrong. Versus Azumi AZM. You got Azumi. Find, Azumi is I, right. You got it. I right. still find it funny that that's Azumi, but maybe there might be something lost in translation with the Japanese uh, kanji. Uh, Tam Nakano and Saya Kamitami. Look. This is like the Joshi attempt of the Dragon Gate Six Man. Yeah. And I think this is a really cool way to shine a light on some Joshi wrestlers in on a big stage. And you know what? Now that Rossi Ogawa is out, maybe we start getting some stardom people in AEW. Obviously, they've hired some people from stardom. Tony Storm came from stardom. Uh, she was there before WWE. Mariah May just came from stardom. Megan Bain was essentially on an excursion in stardom. So I think this is a, a really cool thing that we could potentially see more of. Yeah. Like, this is a good WrestleMania weekend show card. It's it not 
yeah. incredibly flashy. It's got some built matches and it's got some real intrigue. Like uh, Athena Hikaru Shida sounds like a dope ass match. Yeah. Like that could be a four and a half star match. I don't think anybody would be shocked. Eddie Kingston is probably dropping the title to Mark Briscoe in Philadelphia, which is essentially like the home wrestling home of the Briscoes. That's really cool. Lee Johnson has been uh, performing really well in Ring of Honor lately, and he gets a TV title match. Like this is the biggest shot of his career so far. Like there, there's some interesting stuff on these this Ring of Honor show, and it's a Tony Khan pay per view. It's probably going to deliver in a big way. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe they add one more match because I I think there's room for one, and then whatever you do on the pre show. Yeah, I think I, I think it uh, could be really good, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, that's a good start of a card. Um, I, I'm glad that we have the Stardom Six Woman match. Uh, that should be fun, and uh, I, I'm also curious what happens with Starks versus Aminata. Uh Starks had a good outing last time on Ring of Honor pay per view, but it was against Athena, so it kind of doesn't count in a sense, you know, just because Athena's so damn good. Um, frankly, I kind of hope she she beats Athena because I think both of them could really benefit from that. Uh, I think uh, Sheeta needs some kind of direction, and being the women's champ would be at least something and better than what she's likely to get anytime soon on the AW main roster. And Athena could be slight, you know, slated somewhere pretty meaningful in AW's uh, main women's roster. So, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, it should be a really interesting card. Yeah. Um, Nigel McGuinness mentioned he's gotten back in the ring and felt good after. Why did Nigel retire? Was it? head trauma or was it something else we never really got anything clear there were rumors i think uh, that tb was involved i think or uh hepatitis one or the other i forget now sadly um uh, sadly meaning that my brain is bad uh but i i there was also a lot of concern about concussions and he just kind of he's never really talked about it publicly i think he wants to keep it private which hey it is 100 percent his right to do that mm-hmm. um and, uh, you know, I mean, I just hope he's living a healthy life day to day. It doesn't sound like he's really itching to get back in the ring full time. Uh, I'm mildly surprised. I would be mildly surprised if he did not have a match with Danielson and add a all in just because, you know, they've been teasing it for so long. And um, it, it feels like that they are really more than just doing a bit on commentary. I feel like he's actually like trying to build to something. So given all that, you know, I mm-hmm. guess we'll see, but uh, you know, I, I, if I could see him doing that one match and then saying that's that. Um, Listen, I, I, I'm all for Nigel McD- McGinnis versus the clam digger. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would be very excited to see that. Yeah. And it fits very, very easily into the Brian Danielson, let's do cool stuff tour he's currently on. Mm-hmm. All right. Matt Hardy was at WWE with a friend. He's currently negotiating with AW. Stop negotiating with AW. Just go to WWE. You're fine. Go take the money. Um, April 6th collision starts at 11.30 p.m. I believe, Fred... This is because of the NCAA tournament because the final four yes, is on Saturday, exactly. and I believe it's on TNT, not yes, I CBS. Believe so. I believe so. Um, Jim Ross putting out a book of his 50 best calls, and he's calling the book Business is About to Pick Up. It'll be available in May. Very intrigued to see or hear him talk about the process of how they narrowed it down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the call uh, to the book. I uh, wonder how many AEW calls will be in there. Probably a couple, you'd have to think. But given how long his career is and how much you know, how much other stuff he's done, it's not going to be like the main focus of the book, and you know, reasonably so. So I wouldn't be shocked if there were zero calls, um, because the, most of the memorable call, memorable calls were Excalibur. Like you remember Excalibur, or Tony Schiavone going, "It's Sting!" Like. Oh, what memorable Jim Ross call was there? What, like, I don't remember him ever being like front and center for any of those really big moments. Uh, maybe like the Cody Rhodes Dustin Rhodes match, but I can't. 
I can't recall at this point. It may have been uh, early on in 2019, 2020, which is five years and definitely way too long for me to mm-hmm. remember anything. <laughs> but um, at least anything as uh, specific as, you know. Yeah, we're, uh, we are actually approaching calls. five years. Yes, we uh, are. Of the first ever AEW show, Double or Nothing. And I'm excited. Like, yeah, it's it. It'll be cool to kind of see where we're at five years later from that first show. Obviously, significantly better roster, but it's such a different wrestling landscape too. Um, Phoenix and Penta have a, a lucha store called Republic of Lucha. That physical location had closed. They're looking for a new spot. So, yeah, um, all the best to them. My guess is probably just a lease issue where they had to close down temporarily. That happens every so often with uh, businesses. So that's it for the news. Fred, are you excited to talk about this show? Yeah, I am. We actually don't have too much to talk about, just Dynamite, because uh, last week Rampage was immediately after Dynamite, and there was no collision. So it's just a one-show week, which is nice and light for us, a delightful change of pace. And uh, what did you think mm-hmm. about the show, Tyler? I thought it was weird. Mm. I thought it was great at the beginning. Osprey and Shibata was awesome. I thought it was, it meandered a little bit during the middle of the show. Um, The tag title tournament just feels cold as ice. And then you had a great final match with Swerve and Kanosuke Takeshita, which I thought could have been better. But for a TV main event, you ain't going to complain. And Samoa Joe's promo at the end. I said it in the writer slack last night because I watched it on Thursday night after the basketball. Like, just imagine if he got this title run in like 2010. Like, yeah, I know he had one in like 08, 09, but I'm talking like this title run, how good it's been, how yeah, he is presenting himself. He feels like the biggest star in the world. If he had a title run where he was presented like this during his physical peak, how yeah. great that could have been because he's been so great here. And it really begs the question, Fred. And I think this is the direction we should take the show. Should Swerve win or should Samoa Joe keep the belt? Because you could make real arguments on both sides. You could say Samoa Joe should keep it because he's a hot as hell champion. He's performing fantastic. He's getting over, but I don't know financially how how big of a draw he is. So that's, but it's also very early into the rain. He just got the belt on the 30th of December. So we have a couple, uh, like one TV title match with Wardlow. And then we have one pay-per-view, but that pay-per-view was so loaded. You had the debut of Will Ospreay. So was he really the draw? No, Sting was the draw. Yeah. So it's really hard to understand if he is, that fiscally positive as a champion, but is Swerve ready? Uh, It's an interesting question. And and you know what? I I will give all the credit to Joe Lanza, who on the voice wrestling Patreon does the Thursday tier reviews. He brings up the interesting point. Even if he's not ready, you almost have to give him this shot. You do. And you have to give him the run with the belt because he could easily just get get passed up by Will Ospreay, and it feels like the direction is going to be Will Ospreay versus Swerve Strickland at Wembley, which, sign me up. That sounds fantastic. But if you don't give him the belt, when is he ever going to get a shot? And it's not yeah. to say that he would never will, but you have Daniel Garcia who's on the come up. You have MJF who's going to come back. You have Adam Cole. You have John Moxley. There are so many higher end guys we haven't even talked about okada or omega when he comes back hangman page if you don't belt up swerve now is this going to be an opportunity lost to the ether similar to how monty brown just never came close to getting another shot in tna they should have belted him up they didn't they lost they lost yeah. the opportunity and they never got it back. If you don't do it with Swerve now, will you ever get it back? Will the fans be upset because it feels like the fan base wants it? You and I have been clamoring for it for a year. Brad, yeah, to I was give calling this guy for it a at, mega the, push. at the start of 2023. Yeah, um, same here. We are 
like you could argue we have been leading the swerve train. We have wanted this for so long because he's over. He's charismatic. He's great in the ring. And his style is so unique from everybody else. Like how he like links his moves together. That like jump, like uh, that jump kick that he does where he jumps up and it's almost like he hesitates and then kicks you in the side of the head. That might be my favorite move in wrestling. Like it's, it's a setup move, but it's it's it just looks so cool, and it's it feels like a giant fuck you. Like it is, it's kind of on the same level as what the hidden blade is. It just feels impactful. It feels different. It feels so uniquely him. Yeah, I feel like if you're not going to do it, it'll never happen. But do you really want to take the belt off Joe? And that's where this dilemma comes in. These are booking dilemmas, or. Anybody who is in who has the pencil, so to speak, in charge that you have to figure out, that you have to navigate through. And those decisions can be make or break for like different like times in the history of the company. Like yeah. Gato gave Okada the belt in his second singles match back from excursion. Felt like an absolutely insane move. Well, Fred, it worked out because it started the biggest financial boom period in the history of the company. Yeah. But then you have WCW, who had Goldberg lose to Kevin Nash at Starcade 98. That ended up being one of the many things that began the downfall of that company. And it's not to say that one thing is responsible for everything that comes after it, but it can start. It can be a domino effect. And I'm not saying that we're going to see just this amazing boom period from AEW or the the next WCW, but it, it's not impossible to see this alter the direction of the company for the next couple of years. I agree. Um, it's at worst case, uh, you know, at least I should say the um, the thing that is most that is most going to be affected by it is obviously Swerve Strickland. And I think that he is in a position where he needs to win. I feel like, because I worry that if he loses, it'll be comparable to Tyler Black and ring of honor, who was hanging, hanging around that world title scene for ever. They took too long to actually give him the big win for the belt. And by the time he did, the fans were kind of over it. Um, I think you kind of have to have Swerve, uh, get the win over Samoa Joe and take the belt from him. There's nothing wrong with Joe as champ. I don't know that it's particularly really driving business, but it gives him uh, some, you know, a, a direction up top and makes him feel like a true main eventer. And also, I think, you know, it's not like it's hurting the belt at all. You know, Joe's a hell of a champion to have. He, he's a great at being world champion. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that there's nothing that would stop you from having him in the, that, that exact same spot next year. As an example, you know, you could have the belt move around a couple times and have it, in, you know, end up back on Joe. That would be totally fine. Um, but I think that Swerve needs this one here because if he doesn't, it's going to, I think that would actually hurt his momentum notably. And I feel like would put him in a position in the company where he, uh, you know, does not, the question is, is he actually a, a top guy or not? Because if he's not, then he's going to end up like, you know, with Orange Cassidy, when he had that brief window that felt like he could have been pushed as more, and Tony didn't. And mm-hmm. it felt like that window closed and is not going to open again. Uh, Wardlow, when he was super hot, uh, that kind of got fumbled. And now we have Wardlow as secondary heel guy. Um, I, I don't know what the path forward for him is. And, you know, those aren't, those are probably the two biggest ones in AEW. You could probably pick up a couple others. Uh, mm mm-hmm but you don't want Swerve to join that list. So I think Swerve has to win this match. I think the fans want him to. Uh, And even if it doesn't necessarily mean that, like, he is immediately going to be a major draw for um, for AEW, it gives him, you know, veracity. It gives him uh, the, the credentials to be a main eventer and keep him in that top scene and maybe allow him to in the future become an even bigger star. So I think this is actually a pretty important decision. And I think there's a pretty obvious uh, option that Tony Khan has to pick, which is a sort of win. I also think that this needs to be talked about too, Fred, even though he's not 
he feels like an AEW homegrown guy. And kind of uh, let me elaborate. He he had a coffee cup of coffee with WWE. He was in Lucha Underground. He's made a couple of trips to Japan. He's been huge in the Northwest, especially building up Defy. And he's been around for a long time. But Swerve feels like an AEW guy in the same way Orange Cassidy feels like an AEW guy. They feel homegrown to a point. And the fans have really latched on because they've they found their footing. They found themselves as characters. And by doing so, the fan base really like will latch on to you. And yeah. like Sasha Banks, Mercedes Monet, she was in doing some indies, but when WWE brought her in, then the fan base like fell for her like like she was one of their own. She was a homegrown girl. Mm-hmm. She wasn't, but they had that connection because she yeah, that's was, what really matters, you yeah, know. And a- she wasn't like like Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn. They spent a long time in Ring of Honor. They were mm-hmm. never homegrown. They never felt that way. Swerve feels like a homegrown AEW star, just like Orange Cassidy does, even though they aren't. And I think that is the big reason why you need to pull the trigger. And it, you know what? It kind of sucks for Joe. Joe lucked into this a little bit because it's Joe. I'm guessing that the idea wasn't for Joe to win the belt at World's End. It was probably for Adam Cole to win it in a similar way to how they ended up getting there with the turn. But they had to uh, make a pivot because it – he Injuries, broke yeah. his ankle at Grand Slam because of that elevated stage. Just wild to think about. And I wonder if Tony Khan will ever use that kind of setup again. I mean, it's a freak accident, but oh, yeah. it's yeah. something to just be mindful of moving forward. I really think they got to pull the trigger on Swerve Strickland. And you know what? Sometimes it doesn't matter if they're ready. Like, was Chris Benoit necessarily ready when he won the title in 04? Was Eddie Guerrero? Eddie Guerrero didn't really want the belt after a certain point, if I'm remembering correctly. And he dropped it to JBL in July. He won it in February. You could have done a long title reign for him, hmm. but he didn't He didn't want the belt anymore. And within storyline, for both of those guys and how they got built up after their time in WCW and they came in as the Radicals, it made a lot of sense. The moment that they shared at WrestleMania 20, where they embraced in the middle of the ring, both world champions, like it, it felt special. It felt like one of those organic moments that you were able to get because of how everything in their lives had culminated and how you built them up in the, in the company itself. And I think Swerve is kind of at that spot where you almost have to pull the trigger even if he's not. 100% ready. And you know what? You have plenty outside of your world title picture to help carry the show while he gets his footing, while he figures it out. Like I, I'm a big fan of the West Wing. And the last se- season and a half, it's basically the campaign to see who the next president's going to be. And they talk about the presidential voice and sounding like the president. Well, the one thing they never tell you about the presidential voice is you have to be the president to use it. You can sound like a world leader and you can sound like this, that, or the other thing. But you have to actually be that person in order to use that voice properly. So I think it's kind of the same thing with Swerve. Even if he's not ready, you have to give him a chance to prove that he actually is. Yeah, in worst case, he drops the belt in two months and it won't really hurt him. You know, he's going to drop fun. the belt at all out in, or all in anyways. It's, he's going to gonna lose to Osprey. So you would think. Uh, he'll go into double or nothing. He'll have a match against somebody. Um, honestly, and let's transition here. He's going to have another match with Adam Page. That's coming. We know it's coming based on Adam Page tapping out to Samoa Joe. If they do that match at double or nothing, and the idea is Swerve versus Will Ospreay at all in, you have to have Swerve win. I I love the idea of Swerve winning, and I would be fascinated to see how it plays out, and let me kind of explain why. 
Will Ospreay took him like seven tries to beat Okada. Or was it eight or nine? In American television wrestling, we're so conditioned to the 50-50 style booking. And a lot of that just WWE speak. But the general construct, Fred, of this guy just can't beat the other guy. And he comes close. And because right now it's 0-2-1 and in singles matches. Because they had that third match. Swerve could not put Hangman away. And Hangman came out of that feeling like a winner. I think it would be cool to see Hangman have to figure out a way to overcome Swerve in order to become a world champion again. That's a cool storyline that you could use over the course of like a two, three year period. And this is just the one person that Hangman Page cannot get over. He cannot beat. I love that idea. It's been done in Japan for ages. Do you think that this could be a good storyline in American television wrestling, or will it bury Hangman too much? Because it's a different environment. I think he's okay if he doesn't beat Swerve right away. And frankly, I think that there's a there's an argument that he could actually just uh, just wait until you know months or years down the line to go back around to him. Um, I think that. We were. I think there's a good chance that when he comes back, we see him put opposite of the elite with Hakata, and uh, you know that'll be interesting to see um, if that happens. But I, I think that it's not like once Page does return, he's a hundred percent set up with Swerve Strickland. I, I just think there's a a possibility that they go with a different route. Yeah, and it's also one of those things that yeah he he might not be put opposite him right away but it's like that dragon gate thing i still hate your guts i'm still gonna side eye you every time i see you so i'm really intrigued to see how this manifests because swerve feels like he needs to win the title and if he feels like he needs to win the title he probably should and you know what that's okay Mm -hmm. It, it samoa joe did a great job as champion and now we're gonna evolve to something different Let's talk about the SAG title tournament, Fred. All right. I thought it stunk. <laughs> I was, uh, I thought that, I wouldn't say it stunk, but I would say that it was a little underwhelming just because I expected more given who was involved. Uh, I thought Best Friends and uh, The Kingdom was a little clunky and had a bunch of, uh, you know, extra BS that kind of kept it from being a great match. Um, but I thought, you know, Bucks and Private Party was, you know, decently good. I thought it was like a three and a half star match. And even though I complain about the best friends match, I thought that was, you know, good. I went like three or three and a quarter to it. Um, I just, you know, I don't know that it has too much juice. It feels like a, you know, you're setting up uh, Trent and Orange against the Young Bucks. Like that's just an obvious Young Bucks win given the direction of the two acts. And, um, I just, you know, I don't know what's, you know, where the intrigue is in that match. It just feels like it'll be a technically good match that you know, could, will probably hit four stars if they're on their games and trying and everything. But I also think that, uh, you know, it's just kind of going to, it, it's a, it's just obvious what the result is going to be. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, uh, you know, they can't be too excited for that, I guess, frankly. Yeah, it's Tony loves tournaments and sure does. It feels like tournaments have become his crutch to, I just don't know what to do. Let's just throw a bunch of people in a tournament and I'll figure it out. And the tournaments always end up good. The results of the tournaments are much better than the actual tournaments themselves. Now, the Continental Classic was something that he got bullied into. And listen, bullying works. Let me tell you. Um, I was the bullied kid my entire life in school. From 4 to 18, I was the bullied kid. Well, bullying made me a better person, even though my life kind of sucked in school. I don't endorse bullying. I just got to say that. (laughs) I'm endorsing endorsing bullying billionaire wrestling promoters. Yeah, you can say stuff to a guy online and, like, criticize him. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, um, don't go giving some kid a swirly, even though I think swirlies are uh, 
an outdated method of bullying, but yeah. You get my drift. I don't actually endorse yes. bullying, but <laughs> in this sense, bullying works because you, it's it's constructive criticism. We gave plenty of it on this show, but it feels like he, he just uses them as a method of, I don't know what to do, so let's just do a tournament. And look, they made Sting win his last match. I think that was the right call. You gave Greensboro. Like, it, this wasn't some show in Salt Lake City. No offense, Salt Lake City. That's not Sting country. Greensboro was Sting country. And you gave that crowd, the, like, the perfect send-off for Sting. Mm -hmm. Like, that's great. But then you have to follow up. And yeah. it really sucks that Darby's hurt. But you have to follow it up. And... I think the results of this tournament will be good. I honestly think it's going to be best friends versus FTR and best friends go over. It kind of sucks for Chuck Taylor, but I think they end up doing a free bird rules thing when Chuck Taylor comes back where it's like any combination of them uh, defending the titles because look, it's like Trent Beretta has never held a title in this company. Neither is Chuck Taylor. They've been here since day one. Like, to me, I think that's the direction. I, FTR is going to be Big Bill and Ricky Starks. That feels inevitable. Uh, you've got the infantry a win. They don't need it. Top Flight is still really young. They don't need it. But they could get an upset. Sure. The Young Bucks, they, they could easily win this thing. But it just feels with how, they're present, how they presented Best Friends last night, how they've been talking about. They, Excalibur made a mention that Trent has never won a title in AW. I think that's where they're going here. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I really do not know. That's the thing. Uh, I don't know either. And I think that's where my only intrigue lies here. It, this isn't a tournament contrived to get somebody a belt. It's like, I, I think it's being designed right now to give the best friends the run. And it gives Orange Cassidy finally something different to do. But yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I just uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I I just feel like it's so obvious that the Bucks are going to get the belt and you know be champions along with uh, Okada. That uh, I don't know, man. It just feels frankly kind of obvious, you know. So I don't know. We'll find out. Um... How oh, great is Kazuchika Okada? Oh, boy. He's awesome. Oh, my God. Now, I, I'm going to bring something up real quick, uh, which is the Young Bucks after the Best Friends badge coming out and then especially going back down on the the Cody Vader. Um, that popped me really good. I, I thought that was very funny. Um, just these dorks. <laughs> you know? Um, oh, what a great act. Um now, I want to bring something up with you negative, which is uh, Monet. Um, I, what do you, how do you think about her uh, being used this way? I'll ask you. It's a really tough one because I think she's better than this, but I also don't think she's comfortable yet. I don't think she's comfortable enough in the world outside of WWE. I think that's why they brought in Peppermint. Mm -hmm. and I think it's going to take some time for her to just get acclimated to what AEW is and how they're going to go about that. To me, that's the thing. Like, I, I, I think they're just trying to get her comfortable and put her in positions where she can't fail. Because I don't think she's been necessarily great in these promo segments or on commentary. I thought she's she was actively bad on commentary. It was fine. Like I didn't think it was actively bad, but I get it. I thought it was, eh, you probably could have done something else. It sure didn't help, I'll say. Yeah. So you look at those different differences, and it's like, okay, well, how are we going to get her comfortable? It takes time. You... I, I, I worked at multiple restaurants in my life. You go from, I, I even worked at restaurants in the same company, but different franchises. So when I moved, 
I had to relearn how to do the same thing in a different way. And when, when you've been ingrained that long on how to do a process one way, and then you have to change how you're doing it, mm-hmm. it it's a difficult thing. It's, it's not like you're learning something completely new. Fred, if I were to go in and try to learn French, it's not like I learned Latin and then I have to go try and learn French where the, there are some differences, but it's a Latin derived language. Like I'm just learning French. Like it, it's going to be easier for me to do that than have a base knowledge of something that's similar. So I kind of think that's where Mercedes is right now. She's got so much WWE brain and have everything having been so ingrained in her that she just needs time to kind of relearn how to be a professional wrestler in a different environment. And I don't blame her for that. It's not an easy thing with how structured everything in that company is, how you have to memorize lines. You don't really get to be super creative. You don't get to choose your words or even your diction on things. AW is a a company of like, hey, here's your goal. Get there. No, no, I mean, I'm sure they have people like writers for like somewhat in the background, like, hey, what do you think of this general storyline? Okay, then they go with it. Yeah. But like they have a creative team. They don't have script writers. And I just think it's going to take time for Mercedes to just feel normal, feel natural. And that's okay. If it's an issue, Fred, in three months, I think we got a big problem. Yeah, I'm not like dumping uh we're dumping only dirt on her already, but it's seventeen not... days in. I, I'm comfortable with where we're at right now. Yeah. We will see. I uh, I think that last night was definitely not like a let's move forward kind of thing. You know, it was uh I don't know how much it really hurt, but I don't think it really helped at all. So and I don't know. I feel like we need to do something to set up a big Mercedes match, like very soon. I think that just kind of, you know, um, I don't think we can just keep wasting time. I should say. So, mm-hmm. I think yeah. that's, I think that's coming. I think double or nothing, it's going to be Mercedes versus Willow for that TBS title. And Willow gets that, hey, I'm sorry, you're just going to be in transitional champion reign, which Mm -hmm. I think really sucks for Julia Hart. But I also think it's, I don't think you can have Willow lose and then lose again and keep her baby face. I don't think you're going to turn her heel. I, I, I feel like it's, you can have her work heel in the match, but I don't think you can turn her heel. No. Because of it, it'd be like turning Bailey heel in 2017. It, it just doesn't feel right. I think you can do it. Not now. You've established her as a real act, a popular act, a quality, talented act. She's got enough baby face energy for half the roster. Don't turn her yet. For the love of God, don't do it. But I think she could do it. Yeah. I just don't think it's the right time. And I think they're probably just going to have a baby face versus baby face thing. But Willow works as the heel for the match because she kind of has to. But I don't think they turn her. I you know, I actually have a, uh, have a suggestion, which is that it's Chris Statlander with, uh, with Stokely that turns on Willow and, uh, that results in uh, that sets up stat versus Monet. I forget. I may have already said this on last week's show. If I did, sorry. But I, I think that's. I think that's probably the. That feels like the right path to take to me. But you just have to find a way to do it without doing anything that. Uh, you know that hurts um, Willow or Monet. Yeah, I think it's kind of kind of a a fine line. I think that's an interesting idea to have it be Statlander turns on Willow because that's a way to keep her baby face. And that's a way to kind of get out of what this is, which Mm -hmm. this is an organic thing. This isn't Tony Khan booking himself into a corner thing. We've seen plenty of that over the years. This isn't one of those times. And I think that's something worth mentioning here. Um, With that, Fred, like 
there's not a whole lot left to talk about. Anything else on this dynamite that really piqued your interest? Yeah, I love that main event. Uh, if you oh, want to we, talk about we that, forgot, I, I mentioned the main event. We forgot to talk about it. Yeah, that, that yes. rocked. Uh, I will say that I thought Swerve was slightly off that night. Not nothing terrible or anything. I, it's a little nitpicky maybe, but I feel like I've seen better Swerve performances recently. And uh, you know what it felt like? It felt more like a fight. Like yeah. the little bit of clunkiness. It wasn't awful. It was noticeable. And I think that's a good thing once in a while. It it didn't feel like a spectacle. It didn't feel choreographed. It felt raw and real. And, you know, sometimes when you mess up a spot just a little bit, it gives it that touch. And for me, it didn't take away from it. And that, that's, I really appreciated that. Yeah, I, I love the match. I thought it was like four and a half stars. I thought it was damn good. I, I Tony Schiavone popping on the end and screaming five stars. It was a little, uh, little strong. You know, let's way to be optimistic. I feel like, but um, yeah, you know, um, I thought it was a really good match and a good, great TV main event. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I love that hesitation kick he does to the side of the head. Oh, that yeah. might be it's my favorite move in wrestling right now. I, I just yeah, love, 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 love it. Um, that is our show. We're gonna be back next week. Uh, talking even more about this glorious company called All Elite Wrestling. There is a collision this Saturday at its normal time, and then next Saturday, April 6th, is going to be at the 1130. You know what? They also might have it at 1130, Fred, trying to capitalize on that WrestleMania crowd. Yeah, maybe. Where they're just so hyped. Um, it's probably a combination thing. I'm really excited for it. And then um, just in two months, we're going to have the fifth anniversary of All Elite Wrestling. The double or nothing 2024 back at the MGM Graham for a double shot as they're going to have collision there the night before. We're going to have everything you need moving forward for all elite wrestling. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, do all the things to help us grow. People love us in Turkey. We'd love for you to love us wherever you're at. I'm Tyler. He's Fred. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great one. Take care, everyone. Do you like wrestling trivia? then check out the five-star match game, the Pro Wrestling Quiz Show. I'm Joe Gagne, and every episode, I grill three contestants with five rounds of power-packed wrestling trivia. We have over 30 evergreen episodes in the archives covering WWE, AEW, Japan, Mexico, and much, 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 much more. Play along at home and check it out today.